I usually don't have set questions to ask. I ask them based on what you already say. Okay. Yeah. So long you if you say something, I base it just on that. It's just much easier that way <laughs> to me. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. Is it recording now? Okay. Yeah, it's recording now. So I'm gonna start. <coughs> this is it's not a good morning. I'm gonna mm -hmm. start right now for you. I'll say, hi everybody. Welcome back to Hear Our Voices. This is your co-host. Well, it's not co-host. It's me, your host. K did come back out to you one more time, and we have. I'm gonna say Alyssa. Sorry, I'm gonna start over. Alyssa Carlson, first and last, right? Okay. Sorry, I'm gonna do it over. Alyssa Kyle. I'm sorry. Alyssa Carlisle. Kyle. 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 All right. I usually act that right before I do my introduction so I don't forget that my brain is just is scattered this morning. Sorry. That's okay. Alyssa Kyle. Okay. Hello, guys. Welcome to Hear Our Voices. This is your host today for today, K Did. Today, we a special guest that we have on today is Alyssa Carlisle. And she's going to tell us what she does, and we're going to get dive into how she helps the homeless population in New York City. Am I correct? It's only New York City that you work in, right? Correct, yes, just just the five boroughs. Mm -hmm. Just excellent. So can you tell us a little bit more of what you do and your company's name, the nonprofit's name, and yeah. Sure. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Alyssa Kyle, and I'm the Director of Housing Access and Stability at New Destiny Housing, which is a nonprofit um, based here in New York City that works to end the cycle of abuse for low-income survivors of domestic violence by providing them with um, access to permanent affordable housing and supportive services that allow them to maintain that housing. Um, so we work in a couple different ways. We do have buildings that we own and operate and um, about half of the units are set aside for folks coming out of the domestic violence shelter system. And then we also have our rapid rehousing program called Housing Link. And rapid rehousing is um, a program model that seeks to connect folks, in our case, survivors of domestic violence and their families with um, affordable housing in and around New York City and provides them with short-term rental assistance. So rental assistance of up to two years, as well as supportive services um, to help them increase their economic and housing stability. That sounds like a lot, to be honest. <laughs> um, to get into your program, do they have to go through PATH and then go to the other, I think it's called NOVA, I believe, or do they, can they come straight to you to get signed up with your services? Yeah, great question. Um, it works differently for the buildings versus housing link. So for the buildings, like I said, about half of the units are set aside for survivors of domestic violence coming from the domestic violence shelter system. So those, uh, yes, they would have gone either to PATH and been routed to the domestic violence shelter system, or they would have called the hotline and gone into the domestic violence shelter system. Um, but for the buildings, for those DV units in the buildings we own, yes, they, um, that is how someone can access those and then the shelters help source applicants. For Housing Link, for the Rapid Rehousing Program, you do not need to go through PATH or um, really interact with any public assistance um, systems. We get all of our referrals from the Family Justice Centers um, there's one in every borough. They're run by the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence. And they have a lot of different services on site for survivors. So everything from our program, Housing Link, to case management and counseling, all of those different things um, happen at the Family Justice Centers. And so folks will come in there, um, become a client, get a case manager, and then be referred to Housing Link if they have housing needs. This might be a weird question to ask. Um, people might only think that women are usually like, they're the highest people usually who are in domestic violence. Do you see any men come through your program? Or is it we do. Women we, and children? Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. No, we, we absolutely do see men or, um, you know, non-binary folks, trans folks coming into the program. Um, 
data wise, we do have mostly women. Um, it's the large majority are women and many of them do have children, like you said, women, uh, women and children. Um, but that's not to say that there are not plenty of folks who have experienced domestic violence who do not identify as cisgendered women. Um, I think what's important to look at when you're looking at utilization of services is a couple different things. First, you know, even though domestic violence does not discriminate against gender lines or racial lines or anything like that or language, there are other barriers in society, right, for folks um, to access things like housing. So if you have women of color who already, and, and even, you know, especially trans women of color, um, who already have additional barriers to accessing housing and um, education and jobs, all of that, and then you add in um, a crisis like domestic violence, you're going to see folks who, who have those higher needs seek out services more often than let's say you have a white cisgendered man who experiences domestic violence, just the way our world works, um, there is someone who has those demographics um, may not be in a situation that requires as much assistance um, to gain access to basic needs, um, even without the domestic violence, right? If that makes sense. So it's important to look at that. That's oftentimes why we see more women and especially women of color um, seeking out services. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're the only ones who, who do experience domestic violence. That makes so, many, so much sense. I want to tell people out there, if you think you're in a situation and it's not good for you and it's not good for you and your kids, please get help. I'm asking you. I know somebody who almost lost their life in Brooklyn a couple of years ago because of domestic violence. It's not, if they hit you one time, it's going to happen again. It's going to happen a, a cycle. It might not happen tomorrow because it usually takes time for it to happen repeatedly. Please get help. Do not think that you're not worth it and you can't make it without this person. Please, I'm begging you, get help if you hear my voice, all right? It's very important. Your life is important. You are special and you matter, okay? So if you find yourself in a situation, they can help you, okay? Um, do you help people without kids also, or do you only help people with kids? So it, nope. it doesn't matter if you have a kid or not. Run, <laughs> just run and go to the service and they'll help you, yeah. okay? And that's the same for the family justice centers in general. There, you do not have to have children. You don't have to be making above or below a certain income level. You don't have to have legal immigration status. Like none of that, that matters for the family justice centers. Anyone can walk in. Um, well, right now um, you cannot walk in because of COVID, but you can call and get access to services. Um, and eventually they will be open again for folks to come in in person. Um, but yeah, the, none of none of those like demographic categories matter. You can access the services um, at the family justice centers in general, and then with us as well. We don't have any um, hard requirements like that. I was gonna ask this immigration to me is very important because a lot of services don't take people who are immigrants or you know undocumented. Undocumented, if you don't understand immigrants, um, my viewers and. How does that work with your program exactly? Because a lot of places don't take it. How do you guys make it able for people who don't have documentation to get help? So in New York City, it is illegal for anyone to, any landlord or housing provider to discriminate based on immigration status. So we're working with landlords, right? So they legally cannot turn away someone who is undocumented. Um, as long as that person can show that they can pay rent, right? Which sometimes that'll look like us paying rent. Other times it'll look like them paying rent. Um, or maybe they have a city FEPS voucher or a FEPS voucher just for other members of their household. Um, so for folks who aren't aware, if you have a family that maybe has a parent who is undocumented or does not have legal immigration status, 
and then they have children or other family members who do have legal immigration status and a social security number, that household can still get FIPS, FEPS or city FEPS. It will just be reduced um, by the number of undocumented people. Um, so you can still get it. So let's say you know you have um, a household who has city FEPS, it'll cover the rent on this, this building. A landlord cannot deny that household because the head of household doesn't have legal immigration status. That's illegal. So um, in that way, we don't have to do a ton to make our um, to make our um, services accessible to uh, undocumented folks. They just it's just the law. Um, but we do oftentimes um, have to advocate for clients to gently remind landlords especially private landlords, um, like small landlords who might own just like their own one building, one or two buildings, gently remind them that it is illegal to discriminate against people who are undocumented. Exactly. Um, I know that you, as I said earlier, you were people with domestic violence um, problems and things like that. Do you guys give other services mentally, like therapy or stuff like that? Or is it just housing only based that you give? Mm -hmm. So in Housing Link, we only do the housing search and the rental assistance and all of that, but we will work with our clients to get them to connected to anything else they need. So that might be counseling for either them or the children or um, even like medication, paying for medication for mental health or mental, um, you know, concerns. Um, so we can help that way too with financial assistance to access those things. Um, but we only do the housing. And then in the buildings that we own in New Destiny's buildings, there is not um, like licensed counselors. There's not counseling per se, but there are um, supportive programming, um, you know, programs happening for the children and adults to help with some of the, um, mental strain that comes from going through a crisis like domestic violence. So yeah, we do try and make it accessible um, to people in both programs. It just looks a little bit different from one to the next. And another thing, there's a lot of things that come like in packages, you just never know. Do you guys get furniture or any extra money to buy extra things when they get home or just only house itself? That's a great question. So, um, we cannot pay for furniture, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so for Housing Link, Housing Link is funded almost completely by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. That's where most of the Housing Link funding comes from and HUD does not allow programs to pay for furniture um, for whatever reason. So our hands are a little tied in that way. Um, we do try and form partnerships with different uh, furniture companies um, in order to get access to uh, some furniture sometimes for people who really need it. Um, and sometimes we'll get sometimes we'll get lucky and get private funding, you know, from an individual donor or something like that that will allow us to pay for furniture. That's always really helpful. Um, but typically we're not able to do it. So what we often will do is if we're working with someone coming from shelter, we will um, you know, make sure that their shelter is helping them get the furniture voucher from HRA when they leave shelter, or um, if they're not coming from shelter, applying for a one-shot deal or emergency grant from uh, the New York City um, Human Resource Administration to help with furniture needs. So we try and get people connected in other ways, but unfortunately we cannot pay for the furniture ourselves most of the time. I understand. You're still helping with housing. That's on, honestly one of the biggest things. You could mm -hmm. come in and sleep on the floor like I did when I first moved in. And now I have two beds in my apartment. So, you know. That's great. Of, yeah, it really, it yeah. matters a lot, especially in like the winter time when it can be really right. in New York City. We don't have, mm -hmm. It's winter sometimes, so it's excellent to have a yeah. look at your head. How I just had an interesting conversation. Sorry to interrupt. But I just had an in interesting conversation with someone who has experienced homelessness for much of his life and just got an apartment. 
and he was explaining that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that those first few weeks, just the adjust adjusting to that was really difficult. Um, and he did have a different experience than most of the folks we work with who are, who are not homeless for, you know, most of their life. They're homeless typically because of the domestic violence. So it's been, even though people can stay in shelter for several years in New York City, um, it's because of this one thing. And so this was different for this particular person because he had been homeless truly most of his life. Um, and so adjusting during those first few weeks was really difficult and he missed a lot of appointments, couldn't remember to take medication, et cetera. So even though, yes, it's possible to move in and stay on the floor, it's really important for programs like ours and for government, whether that's local, state or federal, to understand that the, the quicker we can help someone stabilize in an apartment and furniture is part of that, um, the quicker they will be able to move on to their other goals, whether that is education or work or just, you know, simply um, recovering from a crisis like domestic violence, taking that time for them and their children. So it's important to remember that like, yes, you know, people can can come in and, and stay on the floor, but we, we don't want that. We want them to be able to move in and, and be stable as quickly as possible. Is They're definitely right. I think I never stayed in the shelter for a long time. I only did for like a year and like three or four months. People, as you said, could stay in there for years. So I feel like I'm very fortunate that I got out when I did. And, but I just think being like, I never thought of post-traumatic stress or things like that. But I heard some people's stories, um, how when they're in the apartment, they can't sleep like well. And I think about sometimes me, I had a, always problems sleeping, but I grew up in like in Queens and now I live in Brooklyn. The noise <laughs> difference from where I live is much different than Brooklyn, which I like having noise. It's not a big, big deal. I grew up by the airport. So I'm always hearing the planes after a while, I just it kind of drowns it out. But uh -huh. I never grew up with people fighting. Like in, in high school, people have fights and stuff in high school, but it, it never was around my neighborhood. So when I was in the shelter, a lot of people were fighting and it was always yelling and cops always coming. And I, I didn't realize I got used to it and it bothered me. I don't want my child, I don't want my head, child to hear that. I didn't grow up hearing that. And I feel like it bothers you a little bit. Like you're always on your toes that you think violence is always gonna happen repetitively. And when I moved out, I moved to, into NYCHA and NYCHA people fight here too. And the cops don't get called on them most of the time. So it's like, it's very interesting how I picked up. I just realized that's like literally probably a couple of weeks ago that I have like a small trauma from the shelter the life I wasn't used to, I grew up in a house in Queens, is is kind of like, it's much different in shelter and then coming to NYCHA with that. It's just, mm -hmm. it's interesting. Your mind, it almost can't rest as much as it wants to because as you hear something that you're not used to, it gets you out of bed or just, it's just a different kind of lifestyle. So right. um, yeah, we just need to help and get ourselves a little bit better and things like that. Um, So with the... um. So you said they don't do, what else do they do? Other, like how would a person, you do you do all the applications for the people or, you know, like in a shelter, how they have a, a, I guess a housing specialist and they fill out all the applications. Do you fill it out? Or would I, like if it was me at home, could I fill it out for myself and get help that way? How would that work? So for Housing Link, it really depends. So we have partnerships with many landlords around the city. So our clients are generally not just sending in general applications. Our landlord partners will tell us, hey, there is this specific unit available, this specific apartment. We'll go through our active clients and figure out who um, <clears throat> that unit will work for based on the size, the rent level, all of that. And then we will put all of the client's documents together and send that to the landlord. So the client will sometimes have to fill out a paper application um, and we can do it or they can do it. We generally, however it's gonna be fastest is how we take care of it. Um, and yeah, so sometimes they'll fill them out, sometimes we will, but it's not the same as, you know, filling out 20 applications a week and just sending them to general email addresses or mailing them in for any apartment that a company might have. Yeah. Um, it's 
you know, it's, it's less of a black hole for us, fortunately, that it's one, it's one apartment that you know that you're, what you're applying for. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. Um, do you have the crisis hotline number you was talking about earlier on off your head or do you have to like, look for it? I can find it very quickly. I believe it is just, oh, I'm gonna, let me, let me just look it up. <laughs> no. I know it's 1-800 and then ends with hope. It's 1-800-621-4673. So you heard folks, if you need that number and you're in crisis, they'll definitely be able to help you with things like that and what do you have an age group that you work with in particular or do you know sometimes they have the families usually like a certain age and not usually a certain age but you know what I mean like it's for shelter is usually somebody over 18 and with their kids or something like that usually coming in and um the youth is like I think I forgot the exact but I think that it's like 20 21 for the youth is there an mm -hmm. age bracket that you work with like if a 17 year old came in and they feel like either their mom or father or whoever is because it could be anybody abusing you domestic violence is violence right. you know and if you live with that person it could just get out of control you could lose your life for no reason so do you have mm -hmm. an age group and what's the youngest usually do you go to so um we do not technically have a minimum age that someone needs to be however because we are getting people into their own apartments you have to be 18 to sign a contract so if we had someone come in who was 17 or younger, um, we would we, we would be able to support them in figuring out whatever housing option worked for them, but it's probably not gonna be, you know, through one of our partner landlords because they're not gonna be able to sign a lease. They're not old enough to, to do that on their own. So um, yeah, we would probably, you know, help them figure out if there is some sort of like youth program, youth housing program they can go to um something like that yeah we haven't worked with to my knowledge we haven't worked with anyone who is younger than 18 um but i do know that we have worked with one he they, he was maybe like 19 when we worked with him mm -hmm. that's probably the youngest yeah okay um so if they go to the youth program and because i know for some reason like the youth money don't have like a lot to go with and because they're so young probably don't get them out that much housing if they age, like, say, it happened at 16, and then when they come back, like, stay there for two years, they'll be 18. Would you be able to help them mm -hmm. then to get housing if they didn't get housing yet? So it gets kind of complicated. We can only support people who are homeless or housing instable because of domestic violence. So... In your example, let's say, you know, someone comes to us because of domestic violence, they're 17 years old, 16 or 17 years old. They go to, let's say, a transitional housing program for youth. And I just want to be, I've never worked in youth services, so I don't know how any of this works. So it's just all of my information is just hypothetical. But let's say, um, you know, someone does go to a youth program, they live there for two years, they turn 18, and usually youth programs do go up to older than. 18, but just for simplicity's sake, let's say they turn 18, they can no longer stay in the youth program. At that point, their homelessness would not be caused by the domestic violence, right? It would be caused by aging out of this other program. So then they would not be eligible for our services again. Um, and what they would have to find a program for folks aging out of those types of youth programs or foster care. Mm -hmm. We see that happen. A, a, a more common situation yeah. where we see that happen um, or could happen is there there will oftentimes be folks who come to the family justice centers for years after the domestic violence has ended which is which is great there's a lot of wonderful services there people really um feel connected to the family justice centers i think and so they'll keep utilizing the services which they're eligible for for many years after and so we will sometimes get someone referred to us who has experienced domestic violence. And let's say four years ago, they came to the FJC for the first time and were homeless because of domestic violence. They went into a domestic violence shelter system. Let's say they got, they got housing and then a year later they were evicted. And so even though they are 
a survivor of domestic violence and they are homeless, that eviction, if it was caused by non-payment, then that homelessness is no longer a direct result of the domestic violence, so they wouldn't be eligible for our program. Um, and this is why it's so important for whether it's our program or any other housing option or sh shelters who are placing people into housing, it is so important to make sure that folks have support after they move into the apartment because exactly. the, you know, the, the journey doesn't end when that lease is signed. Um, people need furniture. People oftentimes, especially with young folks, this might be their first apartment they've ever rented. They might not know how to set up their Con Edison account or pay that bill um or you know anything like um figure out how to get to their kids school from their new apartment all of those things really take a toll on your housing stability and so it's our goal to make sure that if we're placing someone into housing they can stay there permanently if they want to um yeah yeah um proper aftercare especially in the first year because a lot of programs right. have to like pay up to a first year or so it's very crucial because a lot, if, as you said, if it's your first apartment, you might not know how to handle everything. Like I was lucky mm -hmm. I got into NYCHA for my first apartment that I ever had. So NYCHA is much mm -hmm. more easy and I think more straightforward because it based on how much you're making anyway. So it's not going to go over. If I make a dollar a month, they're not going to yeah. take my full dollar. They're going to take 30% of my dollar, right. no matter what I make. Right. And if I make a dollar, I'm probably have on public systems anyway. So they get 280 something right. a month for two people. So um that is very crucial because new york city as if you don't know if you listen from somewhere else new york city is very expensive <laughs> so a lot of times these programs will pay for the year and if that person like say lost a job that last month or something like that they can't pay for the rest of the month happening and they kind of let out on the dirt and back to shelter so a lot of people are repeat people and i guess honestly victims of the shelter system were kind of just left them out there to dry without giving them proper information or even some people's saving techniques. If you're so young, you need to know how to save and know how to keep at least three or four months of rent in your back pocket just in case you end up losing your job. Um, mm -hmm. Honestly, in a pandemic that we had, that probably wouldn't have worked because a lot of people didn't get back their job for months or you know a time later or right. just get laid off indefinitely. That's totally different. But in a hopefully normal world that we're trying to get back to, at least have a couple of months of rent in your back pocket so in case those months do show up and you don't have the money and you're short, you can at least take out your savings. And um, this, not this is not in just your, your regular savings, it's like housing savings plus your regular savings on the side to kind of help you out. I'm not the best at it, I'm just telling you, and I, when you're living from check to check, it's hard to do that. But in my mind, I know that's the right thing to do, <laughs> but it's very hard to get there, especially you have debt from other, oh, you know. Yeah, it is, it, so, <laughs> You're right that, you know, it would be ideal to have a couple months of rent saved up. But if you are making, you know, let's say, for example, let's say you're making $30,000 a year and you live in NYCHA. So your rent is technically affordable, but I should have done an even number. Uh, let's say you're making $36,000 a year. So that would be $3,000 a month. Your rent would be a thousand dollars, thirty percent. All of these are just round numbers, right? In night yeah. So even though your rent is affordable, you know, can you afford to live? Can, to, can you afford everything else in a month on that remaining two thousand dollars in New York City? Especially if you have children, right? That's probably questionable. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the ability to <laughs> put money aside is very difficult and it, it and I think that's one thing people forget is just making rent affordable is just one piece of the pie we also need to make sure that folks have supports um yes. if something happens you know yes um like a pandemic or exactly. or, or a personal emergency um as well yeah affordable rent is an extremely important part of that pie but it's only one piece Definitely. too um and yeah, but there, I will make a plug. If you're in New York City, there is free financial coaching here. Um, you can call through in one and ask for the, the financial empowerment centers and they'll get connected. They'll get you connected with a financial coach or financial counselor who can work through a budget with you and all of that. But it is, 
Yeah, I'm just echoing you. It is not, it's not easy to save money um, <laughs> in New York City, even when you do have affordable housing. It's so true. I think people have a misconception that, oh my gosh, the rent is low so that you can afford it. But if you have, if it's by yourself, maybe it's going to be a little bit easier. When you have a child, you have one child. My daughter, for her right. uniforms, even though I'm not paying for school supplies, it costs me over $200 and change. I'm, I buy five, like five dresses, five shirts, and that's not counting the uh -huh. shoes and the socks. And these kids right. grow like weeds. So it's like, yeah. that's just a, like, in my mind, a small thing. That's only uniform for school. You wear that same outfit throughout the whole year. So like, you know, but what if I wasn't getting food stamps? Then I don't have to pay for food, for my daughter and me. And these right. kids exactly. eat a lot. <laughs> and <laughs> you got to think about all the little things, shampoo, conditioner. So it's only not only my hair that I'm washing, I'm washing another girl's hair. Not like I have a boy who just put like little, you know, soap on it and it's boom, five minutes and it's done, it's over with. No, I have to right, buy yeah. hair stuff, hairstyling things, combs if they're break. You just never know what you think is like Ziploc bags. People don't think that Ziploc bags count, but after a while, $2 hair, $4 hair, it adds up. Toilet paper. We ran out kind of mm -hmm. last year about it. Those things add up. Right. And those are things that, you know, like, oh, I might need these things. I might need toothpaste. No, you need toothpaste to brush your teeth or right. you get cavities and you got to get the pull up, pulled out. These are things that people mm -hmm. need. You need deodorant. <laughs> these are a right. month. So is that like, well, oh, I, I want to, yeah. Also, all of those things do add up. But I think what happens even more so than not being able to afford your like daily expenses is every six months or so something will happen let's say you know um you get sick and you have to you can't work for a week or or a kid gets sick and you can't work for a week or um you know some sort of financial or you have a medical thing um as some sort of financial emergency that then sets you back 500 or a thousand dollars and then you're catching up on your bills so right. that, and that's, you know, and, and if folks would be able to save up an emergency fund, then they can take care of those emergencies when they happen. But how do you, going back to, you know, how this conversation started, how do you set up an emergency fund when you right. don't have enough income to cover your daily expenses, right? So it's this cycle exactly. that, it's a cycle. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that we need to we as in government, <laughs> which I don't work for the government, but like government yeah. in general, um, not New York City specifically, but just in, in America in general, we have a lack of social safety nets um, to support people in finding financial security. And that's what we need to work on. That's so true. That is definitely, that's facts <laughs> because we are struggling. I could say, mm -hmm. though we didn't, we had a pandemic, I wish the government would like other countries that gave us more money during the pandemic, but we see that they do have the money <laughs> to give us. Right. And yeah. as you can see from the TAS tax, tax credit every until next, I guess January, February of next year, or no, take out in December of this year, um, they can shell out the money when we, they think that we are dire, you know, we're in dire problems that they could give us money. Um, they need to help the people out a little bit more, especially under a certain income right. bracket and, and it should depend on what city or state that you live in, because obviously living there is more expensive than living in a place where it's like you, your house costs like two pennies and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm living large and the house is huge. And it's like right. people in New York living in boxes and their rent is $1,000 a month. So it's like, it doesn't correlate, right. but you know, that's what you get for living in New York City. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But I think well, you bring up, like you mentioned, 30% of your income in NYCHA. And yes, that's generally what um, what rule of thumb says is affordable, but you have to take into account how much everything else costs. Like in the right. middle of the country, if you're paying 30% of your income to your housing, that might be totally fine because going out to dinner costs $15, you know? Um, Whereas, and like childcare is much cheaper and all of these things, you know, just the cost of living is a lot cheaper. But in New York City, if you're paying 30% of your income to rent, I think that's just, it's still oftentimes is, it can be too much, especially for families because of the rest of the cost of living in New York City, where 
um, you know, even I'm trying to think of a regular cost. Like, I think I actually was looking at this the other day, like the cost of food, um, like groceries and whatnot is about 23% higher here in New York City than it is in Denver, Colorado. So wow. does That's the same crazy. rule of thumb for rent make sense to be used across the country? Right. Man, that's high. <laughs> this hand number yeah. makes me want to cry just a little bit. Like, dag, can you imagine? Oh my god. Mm -hmm. But um, guys, I just want to. What she does is so important, and it helps out so many families. And you might not think at first, is it domestic violence? Is it? If you're not sure, call somebody who's outside, who's like a therapist, or even call the hotline and ask them. Do they think of the most times you're gonna think, oh, this person loves me, so they would never do this. And you might not even think it's domestic violence. Um, it could be physical, it could be emotional. Because if they're making, if they're really yelling at you and saying, Oh my god, you're an idiot, and this after a while that gets to you, and that's how usually how it starts with the yelling and name calling, and they try to butter you up with love after. That's not the way somebody loves you. Somebody really loves you and want to take care of you and be by your side, they're not gonna break you down, they're gonna build you up. If a person is breaking you down, get out of that situation. There's a better life out there, I promise. I'm not going to say my life is the greatest. I'm never going to say that. And I've, I've never been through a situation with a DV, so I can't say, oh my gosh, it's easy to leave. I can't say that either. But I can say, if you don't get out of it, you can lose your life. And if you care about your life and care about your children, not losing a parent, you should do this for yourself and should also do it for your child. I'm just going to say that and leave that right there. Do you have any last words for the people out here? I will just say that, um, you know, if you sort of like you just said, if you find yourself in a situation where you are experiencing harm um, at the hands of a domestic or intimate partner and you um, and you are looking for support around that, definitely, um, you know, seek help at either the family justice centers or another community based organization that you might have a relationship with and um, of course, if it's housing related, feel free to um, reach out to us at New Destiny and we'll see how we can support as well. So thanks Is so much for having me. No problem. Thank you so much for being on. Is there a website we can just Google New Destiny and it'll yeah. pop up? Okay. Excellent. Yeah, newdestinyhousing.org. Excellent. Excellent. So you don't have to Google it. She told you the information right here. So yeah. um, get that. Thank you so much, guys, for listening to Hear Our Voices. Please come back to the next episode. I hope this was very helpful for somebody out there who definitely needs this information. So we'll talk to you next time, guys. Bye.